So good afternoon, everyone. Um, I've been with a couple of us um, this morning, right, discussing uh, what we are about to show. Uh, but this time, I would like us to focus more on the what and the why we are aiming to release um, or make a proposal to the community uh, to make a blueprint uh, to bring some harmonization and standardization on engineering components that this, eco this ecosystem could bring uh, for um, the next generation of um, SDV tool chains. We have seen from multiple sessions from uh, Aishi, also from our workshop in the morning, that we have different programming languages, and we will keep to have those different programming languages. Uh, we have different and multiple operating systems, application package formats, network topologies. So the complexity is out there, and that complexity is not going to disappear. The other thing that is important to consider is that we don't know what's in front of us, New tool chains will pop up. New technologies will come down to the ecosystem. If we think about some of the developments that are happening, for example, on the WebAssembly world, we might be seeing that uh, landing in the automotive space as well. So when we look at what we are looking for and needing from a community like the Eclipse SDV uh, working group, um, if I can say that we need um, a system or a set of systems uh, that can orchestrate those multiple tool chains out there, those multiple programming languages, those multiple software stacks, those multiple network topologies that we have. Um, we need to look at the system from a, we need a system that is highly composable, right? We need to be able to assemble the multi-part artifacts, like we discussed in the morning, um, for a, a testing and validation scenario. I need to assemble artifacts that are coming from multiple sources, from multiple partners, uh, from multiple repos, to, for example, deliver an autonomous driving solution. So all of that composability is going to be key for us to be agile, when we, de when we deliver solutions uh, to our customers, because that's mainly one of the things that I think is a common objective for all of us, which is contribute and advance the state of the Eclipse STV working group through software, but in the end makes value for us as companies and makes value for the ecosystem in general. The other thing is what I mentioned, which is we need extensibility, right? We don't know what other technologies are coming in front of us. Um, we are moving away from, and again, I'm not an automotive guy, so I tend to like, I, I tend to like and think that a car is just a device that I drive. Um, and when I look at the device that the architecture is changing, I need to think about how am I going to be able to continue to develop features for that device uh, with new hardware that I not, don't know what is going to be and software that I don't know what is going to um, have to build as well. So having a system that is highly extensible to continue to support that new set of hardware and software is also something that, in our opinion, as a, as a proposal to the blueprint, is key for the ecosystem to address. Uh, and of course, I'm making here a strong statement when I say that I think the ecosystem should address, right? In the end, it's all of us that need to make that decision, part of these community days and part of the meetings that we are all together when we make these decisions to evolve the, uh, the, the multiple projects and repos. So what is the proposal itself? Um, Eclipse STV Working Group has three big buckets, um, if, if I can put it this way, in terms of um, um, projects and capabilities that we are delivering. There is an SDV edge where, where several of our projects are there, right? So if we think about um, um, software orchestration and CAIOS, which is a typical in-vehicle edge component, right? If we think about Blue Chi, another one. If we think about uh, a communication protocol, like uh, U protocol from General Motors that is addressing also several of the needs inside the vehicle, that's all edge. We have a big, I would say, category of SDV dev that so far has not been addressed. And we, have, we don't have a point of view as probably one of the leading ecosystems out there today for SDV, together with the other ecosystems that uh, Daniel was just pointing out. We don't have a point of view for the next generation of development processes. We might want to say that, oh yeah, let's just create a couple of, you know, 
GitLab, GitHub, whatever the next set of technology uh, actions and pipelines, and we are all done. But in the end, we know that's not how the software is actually built and deployed. And before even deployed, it needs to be validated and certified. So our proposition for the Blueprint metadata is actually for this ecosystem to think about what are the necessary open source components and engineering components that we need to build and advance so that we can get an end-to-end -end point of view for building software and validating the software so that whenever our consumers get the software out there, they have the trust. For example, when they apply and they look at the process and quality maturity badges that are also part of the current initiatives that we are working. So in the end, what we are proposing is this goal of having templates, metadata, engineering components like Eclipse Symphony, like the software orchestration blueprints, like all the projects that we have out there, under an umbrella that shows an end-to-end -end scenario. And our proposal is to actually start from a testing and validation process. Um, this we will see uh, Anes uh, talk a little bit about that. Uh, and the reason why is that is, again, we are getting very well, I'll say, mature in the process of building software today within Eclipse. Multiple projects are quite mature in the pipelines that they use for build. Multiple projects are now mature in the way they do, for example, releases. But next, the next step is how I take all this software and how I actually able to test and validate before I integrate that in my final pipeline. We also want to say that we don't, at least we say that we have a, a non-goal or we are completely against replacing existing tools existing technologies and very well-defined processes. So no, Eclipse Symphony is not a replacement for any of the orchestrators out there. Um, the proposal of the metadata services that is behind this um, common idea is also not a replacement for existing um, model definitions, uh, files, um, and everything that you use today. What we aim for is to get and work with the community to define those templates if you think about the analogy of the food court of yesterday, when we go to a restaurant, some of them don't have a menu, some of them have a menu, some of them have a paper menu, some of them have a computer menu, some of them have an English menu, Portuguese, whatever. So the metadata gives that predictability and template for people to take our software and orchestrate in an end-to-end -end through this new world of DevOps and agile processes. Some of you have might seen this. It's an ambitious also uh, blueprint because I'm highlighting that we would like to come and get, for example, collaboration from the Eclipse uh, IDE project, the multiple out there that already exist today, or multiple other CLI tools that are able to become the, the, the one-shop developer experience for the STV as a showcase for that end-to-end. -end. What does that mean? The Eclipse IDs are able, for example, to read some of those templates, those menus that we are talking about that we aim that the blueprint starts and initiates and makes available for consumption coming out from the STV projects that are out there. I'm highlighting one that is very well known, which is the one and the four projects that contribute to the software orchestration blueprint. So in the end, with that, um, template-based um, technology, if we want to put it this way, looking at the projects and the capabilities that we have, they would be fed to the metadata services that would understand what we need to achieve. So I want to deliver a testing and validation scenario. And then, of course, Eclipse Symphony and the providers or the implementation projects that we have on Eclipse will do the rest of the job. So there is a lot of analogies, and again, as I mentioned, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, an, it's quite ambitious, right? Um, and for this, and I want then, I see if possible to step in, we also have an ambition, which is bring generative AI for this. So be, as we work through these templates, as we work through um, YAML files, JSON, whatever is the file format that we define for this, instead of us having to describe those manually, we have an intent or an intention that those templates declare. The metadata services comes with an understanding of what you want the system to do. 
and then the providers, the multiple projects of Eclipse SDV and Eclipse Symphony becomes the execution layer for that end-to-end. -end. Ashi? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah, actually, um, for the generative AI, right, if you look from this way, right, you can uh, go from user intention to the uh, uh, desired state, then you simply need to reinforce that state. Uh, you can actually go the other direction, right? Let's say if you have a complex system deployed out there, uh, you can actually ask like questions, right? To gain understanding what's out there, like uh, which version is applied when and why, and what kind of impacts that version has on different parts of the vehicle, which is kind of uh, hard to collect in traditional systems. But with the general AI, you can actually try to gain such of uh, understanding. So should I go to the symphony structure? Yeah, so um, I don't want to repeat everything I said in the morning. Uh, so I, I would try to say something new about this architecture. Um, basically, uh, for symphony to do this kind of a generic uh, orchestration, uh, we define the object model. But this object model is intentionally to be very low level. Uh, if you look at our docs, a lot of uh, objects are mostly key value pairs. So we, we want to try to be the least opinionated as possible. And the expectation is that if you have like a higher uh, system, if you have like a more uh, prescripted uh, spec, uh, you can use that on top of Symfony so that you have this more creative experience for your ecosystem. But the Symphony uh, object model itself is designed to be like as generic as possible. We only create uh, the minimum necessary abstractions. Uh, for instance, we realize an application can have multiple components, and the components may have interdependencies among them, and each component may have some properties. And that's where we stop, right? That, that, that's, that's enough uh, abstraction for us to carry out our job. And for the, uh, everything else, we are leaving to the underlying um, platform. And the whole uh, symphony architecture uh, is designed based on a pattern, uh, uh, which is called HBMVP. Uh, don't look it up, it's not a thing. This is something I cooked up. Uh, I, I wrote several articles on my LinkedIn profile. Uh, I think it's quite an interesting um, a framework uh, basically, uh, its goal is to support this kind of uh, adaptive, uh, extensible system. So if you have a system that needs to be adaptive and needs to be extended over time, uh, you can uh, take a look at this pattern. Uh, actually, when we started with Symphony, right, we only have like a very few uh, boxes, uh, like a three of the boxes in the diagram. Then we just piled on. Right? Uh, many of those boxes are developed in isolation. I mean, there's no interconnections uh, between them. Then, then we put them together, it just works. Uh, because we enforce very um, strict uh, dependency rules. So basically, there's uh, absolutely no horizontal dependency whatever, uh, whatsoever, right? And uh, the, if there are like cross-communication uh, between those boxes, it's all like a message based. So you cannot have like a tight coupling, uh, coupling among the components. And our key extension points is the providers. So basically providers are the ones who understand the specific uh, platform. Uh, the most common providers is what we call target provider. Basically it represents a compute target that we can put payload on it. But inside Symphony we actually we use like um, I think close to 20 different providers. We have uh, like a certificate provider, security provider, state provider, pop sub, message queue. So everything, all the capabilities we need are uh, abstracted as providers. And this allows us to like uh, run everything in memory. So in the morning I was showing when you, uh, when you launch Symphony in the standalone mode, Basically, we just configured a bunch of in-memory providers. So everything is in-memory. You can run it uh, in your machine on the browser. It doesn't leave any like footprint afterwards. But then in your production uh, uh, deployments, 
uh, you can choose like a more uh, uh, reliable disk store, a more uh, robust messaging pipeline, uh, all those things, right? So hopefully uh, we, we can allow Symfony to be uh, tried out and to be even deployed uh, with minimum resource requirements. But if you really want to have a large scale production grid uh, deployment, uh, you should be able to do that as well. Okay? Yeah, thank you. So the other missing piece of the, and um, again, we have talked about this in the morning in our um, own open collaboration forum, is of course how we create this menu of software templates out there for to showcase those end-to-end -end scenarios, right? Um, and when we thought about this, and uh, as I she mentioned, we are actively investigating how we bring generative AI for this. Uh, but what we aim to do right now, and uh, we should be able to open source this set of components uh, to the community probably in the next one or two months. It's, uh, it's just a matter of going through the internal processes of open sourcing uh, the code. Um, we are going to open a package that essentially gives you um, a way to describe the templates, so the way to describe the menu of the um, solution or of the scenario that you want to create out of the Eclipse STV projects. That's one of the concepts, so essentially allows you to describe, discover, but also assemble those scattered artifacts, again being a composition of multiple projects of Eclipse SDV into a coherent view and state that you want to execute. Now, you can ask, so, but what is this template? What is the schema? The way we are making it op release for the moment is completely open. We have a couple of ideas how that uh, metadata should be described. File format is, of course, not a topic here because, again, it's up to us to also, and for you even to implement your own versions. But at least we think that by having that template based, we can start driving harmonization on those end-to-end -end scenarios across the multiple projects. Then the extensions. Um, all of us that are working for companies here, which I would say can be a, um, a representation of the audience, also have a business to do. So the extensions can be open source components that you aim to have within the Eclipse Foundation, but they can also be binaries or some other processes that you aim to make available, for example, only on a, on a on a go-to-market strategy or make available on a marketplace or actually sell to your own customers. So what this means is that you can have your customers creating an end-to-end -end pipeline um, of development, build, and testing and validation using the same metadata definition, but then the real plug component that you want your customer to use on their own uh, backend system can be a, a, a different version, if you want, or a, um, not a free version that you are offering to the community itself. And so that's the concept between the extension model and the templates. Today we have a CLI already implemented. I already mentioned this in the morning. The CLI is integrated with dev containers. Again, following up the approach that we are seeing on across multiple projects of Eclipse SDV that gives you a unique developer experience where you can build and test everything on your own computer. And we are also making available um, a REST server or a, REST, uh, a service with a REST API so that you can then scale down and implement these in, um, I'll say, and take to production systems. So what is missing here right now is, of course, a template and a validation example or what kind of contributions are we expecting or we would like to see from the community. And for this, I would like Anes to talk a little bit about how they see this overall process and what kind of contributions they think this, they can bring to the table so that we can kick off uh, these all together. So many of you will know the AVL DevOps pilot and we from AVL agreed that we need this metadata services to manage configuration and also Symfony to basically get these features into a pipeline. Um, and we thought, what can we do uh, to test this approach for us? And we are working now together with Microsoft to bring Symfony and the metadata services into the AVL DevOps pilot. And as first steps, we want to then uh, integrate our functional testing solution and also our co-simulation platform and uh, create the templates for this and the extensions to basically make a showcase um, how this can work 
and also then as contribution to the community, share our experiences, uh, the benefits we get from it, and also um, how uh, the metadata templates, configuration, everything we needed to create for doing so. Yep. Um, so one thing I want to point out is we have seen from Daniel a presentation where there is an initiative about, um, and I, again, I don't remember the name of that, Federate and all the layers. Yeah, but definitely what we think we can address and start contributing back with, with also with European Union, is on the SDV, on the SDV OF framework, right, which is one of those layers. And this can be the basis for those contributions back uh, with and collaboration with you. Um, I'm not going to show the, the video of uh, Symphony. We already seen that in the, in the session in the morning. Um, the video is on, the link to the video is on the PowerPoint for you guys to, to have a look. Um, and if I can just move on. In this demonstration, no. we are going to deploy a distributed edge application spanning multiple operation systems. To the right, we have Kubernetes. And to the left, we have an ECU running on Flatcar OS. And we have a Windows gateway, and we have an XP board sure. running on ThreadX. And my application is comprised of multiple components. For Kubernetes, I want to deploy a pod. And for the Flatcar system, I want to deploy a WebAssembly module and the eBPF module. And for the Windows gateway, I want to deploy a Windows application. And for the XP board, Okay, so the, the video is 10 minutes long, right? It goes through the use case um, uh, example that we built out uh, with Symfony. Again, it's out there, just whenever uh, you have time and if you see value, uh, go check it. So what are we aiming to do right now? Um, as we mentioned also in the morning, there is a work stream community meeting or gathering if you want um, every, three, every three weeks. It's a kind of a strange setup, I have to recognize that. Uh, but where we get together and we discuss the next steps for the blueprints for the software orchestration, and we are aiming also to bring now Ashi into the picture, um, the metadata blueprint and how we think about building uh, this blueprint um, all together. So I definitely invite you uh, to come to that uh, meeting that happens on Wednesdays around 4 p.m. Central European time. Um, the last point is, of course, we are going to make the official submission to the Eclipse STV uh, working group. Um, it will follow the typical process of voting. Um, we don't um, say that this is complete. There is a lot of filling uh, gaps within the, I would say, the the vision, we have a couple of ideas, but again, we definitely welcome you all to tell us if we are going into the right direction, what is missing, what we need to add, and especially how we think about this, enabling this, if I can put it, marketplace of scenarios that are driven by uh, metadata that our customers and partners can build into end validation scenarios. So with that, uh, we have five minutes, I think, for q and I I want to thank you for your time, especially at the, after a long day and a half, one and a half days. Um, and again, uh, thank you for being here and open for questions. Thank you. Any questions? Kai. Um, <clears throat> I was wondering if the, what do you call it, the metadata service, is that what is being created as part of the blueprint? Because it feels like that could be a useful component in itself, independent of any particular blueprint, right? Yeah, it's a good question, Kai. Um, it can be part of the blueprint, but if you, s I would love actually for the community to tell us if it can be a project by itself. Because in the end, it's actually a configuration management system that knows how to take those template menus for scenarios that can be connected to a generative AI LLM, blah, 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 that in the end spits out Symfony object model, which is a unified object model that everyone can build upon, so no secrets attached, as a common API, which I think is a uber vision for all of us. Um, and in the end, it might have value by itself. 
I don't want to claim that I, I think it's or can be a configuration management. If you guys think it can be, I'll be very happy to submit it as an independent project and then plug it to the blueprint. The reason we are bringing the blueprint is because we think that we need to start looking and having a point of view on how we um, address the ecosystem. And again, the ecosystem is here, but also people that are not here and having a point of view on the next generation of development processes and GitOps. And if I can go a little bit further, what, is, what does it mean platform engineering for the automotive world? Because this, in the end, this is what we are talking about. It's all about platform engineering. So is it then kind of opinionated about a particular domain that it supports in the beginning? Or what's the idea here? So the way, again, um, we cannot boil the ocean, right? So we were looking at testing and validation as the first scenario or domain, if you want. So can you maybe give an, a concrete example of what kind of template it would support or understand? Is it about, hey, set up a range of ECUs and to be tested or something? Is that what we're talking about? Do you want to? Yeah. Yeah, so basically, um, doing testing, you need to set up simulation models. You need to have a software of the ECU you want to test. You need... Um, a version of the co-simulation platform, a version of the testing solution, you need tests, so there are many, many metadata uh, and configuration which needs to be managed all the time. If we want to do that from the pipeline, we need to basically always pull in the newest artifacts, and then uh, if we do a test run, uh, create all the components in Kubernetes or via Symfony, and uh, to basically close this tool chain and have fast reaction times, we think we for sure needs something like metadata services, so everyone would need it in a pipeline. Um, and the better it's automatized, uh, the faster the feedback loop to the developers or engineers will be. So um, I think it should be an independent project, but that's for the community to decide. Um, yeah, but for sure we need it. So. I can be quite specific if you want, because we have been building that uh, metadata example. Uh, one of the scenarios that we have built out in the, by using the template definition is you describe a set of virtual ECUs that in the, for our world, just again to make it clear from Microsoft perspective, uh, it's just a one virtual machine or a couple of virtual machines that for example supports nested virtualization. In the template you describe that you want that high performance computer as a virtual unit in the cloud you describe that you want to have three domains or three partitions. One of them could be a, an Android AVI, another one could be a digital cockpit application, and another one could be whatever. Um, on top of that, as soon as you describe this in metadata, the system needs to know, because you are asking for three domains, the system needs to know that the HCP virtual platform you want to spin up actually needs to support nested virtualization. So this is where the system starts to become a little bit more intelligent what it needs to do. Now you need to specify what is the operating system you want to put on that HCP, again, virtual cloud platform, if you want. And of course, one of the examples we use, um, because again, I think it's more acceptable, uh, is just build the Octo, right? And before you actually build and deploy the machine with the Octo as a base operating system, you need to build the Octo itself. So you describe on the metadata that you have a dependency for the build itself, right? And the system goes and executes a GitHub action, a GitLab pipeline, again, whatever it needs to call to build. As soon as you build, you sign all the system that now your HCP or quote unquote virtual ECU is ready to be deployed. Now what you have on the cloud or on a environment, let's get out of the cloud for example, you have that virtual is your HCP with your base software and your base configuration for those three partitions. The next step is apply the desired state, which could be or can be or will be a set of software tools and testing that are going to be executed against that virtual compute target. And we will um, then capture the necessary results out of that execution. This is the template that we have built, we have tried, um, and again, we would like to just open source and see the value for this complete end to end scenario. Again, starting from a testing and validation perspective. On this scenario, the testing validation thing, mm -hmm. do you already have a view or maybe some exchanges like how this would interact, interplay with the Open Dude guys for, you know, where you get then actual distributed resources into your 
uh, world, etc. So I haven't talked with the OpenDuty team, uh, but I think um, AVL was also or is one of the contributors to OpenDuty. I would love to have them part of that testing and validation as well. Uh, again, I was very interested on the session yesterday, um, and I, again, I will reach out to them offline um, and then bring them, if possible, to that work stream collaboration, because I think that is, first, they have a framework for building those virtual ECUs, as I understand, first step, and so that is a provider. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this, right? Yeah, that, that will be, for example, a, a component like a provider, right? Which is an open DUT virtual ECU. Then you have um, a job, and I, I think they even have shown a, a JSON with some DSL that generates the jobs, right? That is a template and contains an extension code that you want actually to run. So basically, that's how I would foresee all of us collaborating, because I think they are a critical part um, of this idea for this end-to-end -end STV thing that we are kind of proposing here. Okay. Any other questions? No? Yes? We don't have any questions from the online audience, so... Thank you. Thank you all. Enjoy the rest of your day and safe travels for those.